Good evening and welcome to the Board of School Trustees meeting for Fort Wayne Community Schools. This meeting will be open to the public during Indiana's ongoing public health emergency as declared by Governor Holcomb. Masks must be worn at all times on Fort Wayne Community School grounds. Social distancing will be practiced at the meeting, therefore some members of the public who wish to attend may be excluded. If you plan to attend media, please email Public Information Officer Krista Stockman. All others email the Clerk of the Board, Angela Filler. The public is encouraged to view the meeting at Cable Comcast 54 and Frontier 24, the live stream on our Facebook page, or the LTV 2454 Fort Wayne Community Schools YouTube channel. Priority for attendance and in-person will be, will be given to the members of the media. We'll begin our meeting, as always, with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now the roll call of members. Good evening, Steve Corona from the 5th District. Riley Booker, 4th District. Jennifer Mathias, 2nd District. Maria Norman, member at large. Julie Hollingsworth, District 1. <coughs> Noah Smith, District 3. And to my left is Dr. Daniel, our superintendent, and filling in for uh, Angela Filler, the clerk of the board, is Cheryl Skelly. And I'm Ann Duff, a member at large. We will begin with awards and recognition, and Jennifer is going to do our awards for this evening. It is recommended that the board recognize Sean Robbins for receiving second place in the Lincoln Foundation Collection statewide essay contest. Friends of the Lincoln Collection provide outreach to public schools and offers essay contests. The statewide essay contest was entitled Voting Then and Now, and students were challenged to first explain what was done in 1864 to make voting easier for the Union soldiers. Second, make an argument as to why and why not it is important to make voting in the 2020 general election easier for Hoosiers. Students were asked to support their response with at least three pieces of evidence, and Sean earned a $500 cash prize. Unfortunately, Sean is not here tonight, but accepting on um, his behalf is Emily Oberlin, New Tech's director. Behalf. It was really cool when he won it because the first thing where a young lady states like, I don't know, cash, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and he responded the way he, he looked at the lady giving it to him and said, I worked really hard on this, I'm glad you liked it. Oh. It was such a cool response as an educator to hear him focus on that versus focus on, ca on cash cards. So, I'm going to try to get this thing. It is recommended that the board recognize Luca McGee for placing 21st at the 2021 IHSAA State Swim Meet in the 500 meter freestyle. Luca McGee is the first swimmer in Wayne High School history to make it to the IHSAA State Finals. Please come forward in as your name is called so we may congratulate you. Luca McGee, student, thank you. <laughs> Whitney Sharon, coach. Whitney Sharon, coach, and John Hauser, principal. Luca, what's your best time? That's a lot of swimming, isn't it? 500 meters? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I got 506. You got what? 506. Oh, okay. Luca, so just over five minutes. Huh? I'm sorry, Julie. Go ahead. <laughs> five minutes, right? Yeah. Not five. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> In what year are you, Luca? Uh, I'm a freshman. A freshman. Oh, so great. You've, got, awesome. you've got some years to come. Yeah. That's exciting. Awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. It is recommended that the board recognize Caleb Livin and Paige Lowry for winning the New York Times Network Coming of Age Contest. Kayla, who is a senior, produced artwork with acrylic paint and markers entitled The Great Wave circa 2020. She was inspired by the famous artwork The Great Wave of 
Kangangawa, as she thought of the chaos that filled the lives of many teenagers throughout the year. She made the famous painting her own, turning it into dark waves and filling the background with, with um, letting headlines, leading headlines from throughout the year. She believes it represents the turmoil-filled year and acts as, if, acts as a bridge of shared humanity felt by many over these trying times. Paige Lowry, a senior, produced her winning piece as a video. She designed the storyboard shots and conducted the editing entirely alone, using her brother to record a couple scenes that she could not do by herself. Her piece is called, What Has 2020 Been Like For You? Please come forward as your name is called so we may congratulate you. Kayla Bliven, new tech student. Paige Lowry, new tech student. Beth Manili, facilitator. Josh Smith, facilitator. And Emily Oberlin, new tech director. And it looks like they brought their artwork. Can we get to see the video? Oh, nice. Yes, we do have the video, and we'll watch that in just a second. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. sorry for bringing that up. So, ladies, I'm interested. Since you are <laughs> since you are both seniors, and there's a microphone right there, what are your uh, future plans, and does it involve? Art or video? Let's just step up the mic. So my plans next year don't exactly involve art. I'd like to continue art in the future, though. Um, next year, I plan to go to Purdue University. Um, I'm in the Honors College, and I'll be going for veterinary medicine. Oh, for you? Um, I would actually like to continue to do art. I don't have like a super. Um, like concise plan yet. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to take like a year to travel. Um, I'm really into concert photography. That's kind of hard with our COVID situation, but that's what I would like to do is travel and do concert photography. And concert photography is? Yes. What, what, what is concert photography? It's um, just like going to concerts, being like front row and taking photos of your favorite artists. Like mm -hmm. my passion is music and uh, art, of course. So I would like to be able to capture my favorite artists like on a stage. Which is who? Um, my favorite artists are probably Harry Styles and Billie Eilish. I'm really into like Indian pop. I also want to like stay here and capture artists locally. That's probably where I'll start. Nice. Great. Great. Well, congratulations and good luck to both of you. Thank you so much. That's cool. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about the piece? Oh, sure. Do you want me to come up to the mic? Sure. sure. Okay. <laughs> So for my piece, I did take inspiration from the famous painting, The Great Wave. But in contrast to the original painting, which depicts, um, uses calm colors and um, kind of a serene scene to um, tell a story of something super huge and tragic, I wanted to do something slightly different. I decided to use darker colors, and I filled the background with headlines from this year. And why I chose to use different colors is because it was so in your face. Everything was so different this year. And it was huge. Every, there, it's a year of big transitions. And that's what I wanted to tell. How would you describe this year for you girls as seniors? Um, it's an adjustment. I think that um, at first it was really scary. It was weird. But as the year went on, it felt more normalized. And I think that it's, it's going to be an interesting thing to tell in the future. It's going to be... Really, it, my, if I have kids, it's going to be something that it's going to be unique to our senior class. We hope. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. I definitely couldn't have said it any better. Um, it's interesting. I don't think we could have done it without the support from like our teachers, especially Ms. Oberlin. Um, she helped us seniors adjust. I know that we were pushing back. We were like, we need to get like things for seniors. Like she allowed us to go to one homecoming game, like football game. That was like a big deal for us. <laughs> so it was crazy, lots of chaos, but it has become more normal. And I hope that it is better for the next classes too. Thank you. Thank you. Get to Thank you. 
Stacy, here to you. What has 2020 been like for you? <coughs> well, where do I start? If I could describe 2020 in one word, it would be lonely. Now, I could use many other words, but for me, I felt really lonely this year. After we basically had to lock ourselves away in our houses for months, I didn't really do much besides scroll endlessly on TikTok for hours and hours and hours. Quarantine really did help open my eyes a lot, though. I had time to reflect on many things going on around the world and was able to participate in life-changing events. Images that still burn in my head every day. It's hard being locked in a house with just your family, and it's hard to not be with your friends. But one of the changes that hurt the most was my senior year. If we're being honest, school has never been my favorite, but I was going to make my last year great. Then everything changed. I go to an awesome school with awesome people, so it's hard to face the fact that my last year will never be normal. I really don't know if I'm ever going to have a prom or a graduation or be able to sit in a normal student section with my best friends. But I'm still keeping my head up. I'm trying my best to make the most out of a chaotic situation. 2020 has helped me grow and taught me lessons that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. And that's what 2020 has been like for me. Here's to overcoming and adapting to any of life's challenges ahead. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. I've, I've already seen that a few times and still got a little okay. teared up when mm -hmm. I even that time. So thank you, both of you. Great work. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we are on to our consent agenda. It is recommended that the board approve the vouchers for the period ending March 22nd, 2021 and the payroll for the period ending February 26, 2021. All vouchers paid by the Fort Community Schools appear on a voucher listing total, uh, $6,891,561.48. Gross wages and fringe benefits paid by the Fort Wayne Community Schools appear on the payroll certification document totaling $8,417,083.28 for the period ending February 26, 2021. And we also have um, personnel report to approve and our minutes. Uh, Dr. Daniel, was there anything on the personnel report you wanted to mention? No, there's nothing there. Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion on the floor to for approval of these? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and then we have our, our first item on our under new business. We have a resolution regarding the Fort Wayne Community Schools Building Corporation. It is recommended that the board pass a resolution to approve matters related to the Fort Wayne Community Schools Building Corporation including reapproving its articles of incorporation and code of bylaws and the reappointment of its directors. Furthermore, it is recommended that the board approve the second amendment to the master lease and set the public hearing on the second amendment to master lease for April 26, 2021. These approvals are required to facilitate financing of the 2021 FWCS school building basic renewal restoration and safety project approved by voters in 20, on June 2, 2020. Prior to this meeting, the Board of Directors of the Fort Community Schools Building Corporation approved the form of Second Amendment to Master Lease and authorized the execution of the Second Amendment to Master Lease. The Board of Directors of the Fort Community Schools Building Corporation and the School Board of Trustees will convene again on April 26 to take further action, including approval to issue bonds. The School Board of Trustees will also conduct a public hearing on the Second Amendment to Master Lease and the appropriation of the bond proceeds for the 2020 FWCS School Building Basic Renewal Restoration and Safety Project at that time. Bond Counsel Jeff Qualkenbush of Borns and Thornburg and Chief Financial Officer Kathy Friend are available to answer questions. Is there a motion on the floor to approve? So moved. Second. Are there any questions? Second. Steve. Just uh, to Kathy Friend and Jeff Qualkenbush, uh, anything that we need to keep our eyes on as a school board since we did this the last time? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Qualkenbush with Barnes and Thornburg. Uh, pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, Ms. Ms. President, ma members of the board, uh, Dr. Superintendent. So anyway, uh, no, there's nothing that we really need to keep our eyes on any different from the other transactions that we've done in the past. 
Interest rates continue to be very low. They have ticked up a little bit in the last 30 days as uh, the stock market has continued to have a very successful year already and treasuries have, have moved up as well. But we're still at very low rates. The current projections are that the debt service fund tax rate would be at or below what was projected back in 2020 when we did the project uh, approvals back at the end of December of 19 and the beginning of 20. So. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the next item on the agenda will be uh, Noah. We'll read this one. It says recommending the board approve the purchase of 621 Lenovo ThinkPad 113 Yoga and one, excuse me, 1.13 Yoga and 1,442 Lenovo Yoga 11E ThinkPad computers from Process of Indianapolis for one million one hundred eighty-seven thousand seven hundred thirty-seven dollars and four cents. The purchase of these laptops represents the last purchase of the fifth year of the five-year technology plan that ensures students and teachers have current technology to support instruction. Since we were able to accomplish our one-to-one -one goal during the fourth year, this purchase of teachers and staff computers allows to begin our replacement schedule. FWCS was able to secure pricing that was below GSA or General Service Administration pricing. And the law does not require public bidding for purchases made under at or below GSA pricing. Funding will come from the school common fund and Jack Bird is here to answer any questions. Thank you. Is there a motion for approval? Move for approval. Second. Thank you. Any questions? Jack, is the difference between the two ThinkPads, is one the teacher version and one the student version? Yes, the L13 is the teacher version and the 11E is the student. Anything else? Are you having problems getting product in? No. Uh, not this time, or not. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Any others? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, next, Maria will take the application for a common school fund loan. <coughs> it is recommended that the board approve the application for an acceptance of an advancement from the Indiana Common School Fund for educational technology equipment in the amount of $2 million. Advancement from the Common School Fund provides funds for school districts to purchase educational technology. The Fort Wayne Community Schools will use these monies to help fund the FWCS technology plan previously submitted to the state. Technology funds are currently insufficient to fund all of the technology needs of the school corporation. Funds are provided as a loan and are awarded to school corporations on the basis of assessed value per pupil with low assessed value pu per pupil uh, corporations <coughs> receiving funds before high assessed value per pupil corporations. FWCS therefore cannot be assured of receiving the requested advancement. Should the application be successful, funds will be budgeted in the debt service fund to repay this loan beginning in the year 2023. Interest on the loan is expected to be no more than 4% and is likely to be as low as 1%. Common school advancements differ from school technology advancement account loans, <coughs> which FWCS receives on an annual basis. Unlike CSF uh, advancement, the STAA advancements are given to all applying school corporations regardless of their assessed value per people ranking. And Jack Bird, Director of Technology, is here to answer any questions. Thank you. Is there a motion for approval? So motion. Second. Okay, any questions for Jack? I have one question. I don't know if you know the answer, Jack, or maybe Kathy, but on that continuum from low AV per pupil to high AV per pupil, where are those Fort Wayne Community Schools? We are about right in the middle. Right, the average, yeah. And what's your plan to do with the money? It, well, I was going to say, by the way, this money is not the CSF money to pay the board rec you just approved. This is for addition, different projects. The, we got the approval for that one already. So Jack, he might want. He's got it. He completed the application, and he can outline the priorities of that. Yeah. So this is where we purchase all of our uh, student technology. So all of our. Uh, the laptops that you just approved in the prior rec. Uh, we purchase our teacher devices from this. Uh, we purchase any classroom audio visual equipment, so like the projectors or the monitors that we put in. 
uh, any services that we need to install those. Uh, we purchase STEM steam tools with these uh, funds. Um, we purchase software licenses, so some of the district-wide software that we use, like Cami or um, uh, Land School or things like that, we purchase from here. But it has to be used directly for student instruction. No infrastructure uh, purchases are made from these funds. Um, and it's a loan, a competitive loan? Yes. Okay. I guess my only other question would be, and maybe this is not the right time for it, but um, would the federal funds we've gotten go towards some of these acquisitions for COVID and all that stuff, or different well, programs, different thoughts? And we have made some acquisitions with federal funds. In, in, in the next round, we, we definitely plan to use some of those funds for those. So um, I've thought a lot about this because this is part of our, actually our debt strategy, and um, these, these these loans are part of our 0 .3028 debt service fund that we have um, committed to. That would change that outlook if we if we used did all these purchases through the federal grant, and then that would keep us from spending some of the federal grant on other things. So, it's I think we have to wait till we get the next one. This the round that we have currently. Jack has already um, given us what he would like to spend out of there. That won't change what he will need out of CSF he will still need all of the CSF dollars that we apply for twice a year. So, um, but there could be a case maybe for the next round that we might want to think about that. And again, we still could apply, but may not get it. Is, is that correct? Too? Yeah, we have been pretty fortunate though. We have, there was only a couple times when I remember in that I've been here that we did not get it. So even though we are in the middle of the ranking, a lot of people don't use this for the strategy the way we use it. So um, apparently there's been enough funding in that, uh, that pot to, it's like a revolving, you know, pot of money that's available. So um, we always take advantage of it because of a 1% interest rate. That's a really great rate for us. Sure. And um, then that doesn't make us, you know, commit to using our other operations dollars um, for that, for these purchases. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you say that you, we apply to this twice a year? Yeah. Yeah. The STAA is once a year, mm -hmm. the, and that's about $700,000 approximately. And then this one, we, there's a spring and a fall installment. So, and we have, we, we apply for those each time and uh, it's been a great way for us to keep our technology current. So. Do we typically apply for the same amount of money or is it just Yes. Scary? Yes. We um, really, um, once you go over $2 million, there are um, requirements that the state has that um, would change the, um, there would, there would just change the requirements that we would have if we went over $2 million. So we just keep it at the $2 million. Plus, that's probably the right amount. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a lot to deploy um, that much spending. So, um, so that's, we used to do a little bit less than $2 million, but now we, we raised it to an even $2 million. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Any others? Okay. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Kathy. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, next is Julie with the appointment of Project Architect and Construction Manager as Construction <coughs> CMC for the renovation of Wayne High School and accessibility and security improvements at Forest Park and Washington Elementary Schools. So it is recommended that the board approve the following design and construction manager as constructor CMC uh, contracts for the renovation of Wayne High School and accessibility and security improvements at Forest Park and Washington Elementary School projects. So from, uh, so architectural and engineering services are from Design Collaborative. The uh, total estimated design services contract is $1,895,625. And the pre-construction uh, CMC services are from uh, Hagerman Inc and that contract is for 50000 Now, the renovation project at Wayne High School consists of architectural, mechanical, plumbing, and electrical renovations. The accessibility and security improvement projects at Forest Park in Washington include the renovation and or relocation of the office suite to facilitate, facilitate an entrance with enhanced security in the addition of limited use, limited application elevators, provide accessibility to all levels of the building and meet the uh, ADA standards. Uh, the contract procurement method for these projects is construction manager as constructor for publicly funded projects as allowable for Indiana code. 
The recommendation includes the design services contract based on a percentage of construction value, as well as a fixed fee for the contractor pre-construction services. An additional recommendation for construction manager services during construction will be presented at a later date, along with the establishment of a final guaranteed maximum price for the project. The overall construction budget for the projects has been established at $42,125,000. These projects will be funded from the 2020 School Building Basic Renewal Restoration and Safety Project. And questions will be addressed by Director of Facilities, Darren Hess. Thank you, Julie. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Darren? So, Darren, this is a new process you mentioned at the last meeting when you made your presentation. Is that right? Uh, that is a, uh, correct. This is the first time we're going to use this uh, procurement method. Yeah. After visiting Forest Park, uh, you got your work cut out for you for a secure vestibule. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful old school, but that'll be a challenge. Yes, it will be. Anything else? Okay, thank you, Darren. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Raleigh has the 2021 Field Sports Lighting Project. Is that for me? No, that's for me. Can I see yours, Bob? Something's going on with my computer here. Yes. Yeah. It is recommended that the board approve the following construction contract for field sports lighting replacements. Total contract amount $710,000 and that's with Musco Sports Lighting LLC. The project includes replacing the field sports lighting at Northside, Northrop, Snyder and Southside High Schools with new LED sports lighting. The project was designed and procured through Sourcewell Purchasing Cooperative. Indiana law allows for purchases made through competitively bid contracts from approved cooperative purchasing entities. The project is funded from the operations fund, which is identified in the capital projects plan. This recommendation is within the program budget. Project specifications require the work to be completed by July 30th, 2020, and Darren Hess is here to answer questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any questions for Darren? Darren, does this include all field lighting, like football, baseball, softball? Uh, no, it's just on the main football field. Just on the main football field. Correct. Okay. And I know that I asked this previously, but just so that everyone knows that we're not excluding Wayne, um, there was a reason why Wayne is not on the list. Correct. Uh, Wayne still has useful life in it. It was uh, replaced in the early 2000s. Thank you. I know when we go into a school that has new lighting, it's just a huge difference with the updated lighting. Um, will there be a noticeable difference on, with these lights on the football fields? Yeah, the biggest difference, uh, since they're LED lights, um, similar to in the, in the classrooms, it's a lower intensity, so you actually have lower foot candles on the field, but it looks brighter uh, because of the quality of the lighting. Nice. All right. So how, how many, what's the longevity of, or the proposed longevity of these LED versus what we have now? It's a similar, um, it's 20 to 30 years, uh, but you don't know, I mean, it's kind of looking at 20 years and saying what's the next greatest thing from LED light. So mm -hmm. 20 years ago, metal halide was the greatest and best light you could buy. So I think the technology likely will out, it, it'll be outdated before it's useful life. Great, thank you. Doctor. Anything else? I right, thank you, Darren. Hey, Darren, I do have one question and it's not really uh, anyways, it's, it's a lighting question. Is there still functioning lighting at the what's now the South Side Annex? What used to be the football field that's now used for soccer? We're parting it out right now to keep Snyder. We're parting that system out right now to keep these others going. Okay. So it's not functional now. Right. Right. Anything else? All right. Thank you. All in favor? All right. All right. Any opposed? Okay, next up, it is recommended that the board, <clears throat> excuse me, approve the following construction contract for the 2021 Helen P. Brown Natatorium Pool Bulkhead Replacement Project. The base bid is, um, and the total contract is $178,305. The project includes the replacement of the pool bulkhead, which separates the competitive swimming pool and the diving well and allows for different pool configurations. The project is funded from the operations fund, which is identified in the capital projects plan. This recommendation is within the project budget. 
Project specifications require the work to be complete by August 13th, 2021. And questions will be addressed again by Darren Hess. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Any questions? Um, hey, Darren. <laughs> so, pretty big difference in the two bids. Um, do we have, what do we know about the, how do you pronounce that, Natari? It's Natari. Um, Natari Corporation. Natari and Paddock, P-A-D-D-O-C-K, are the two most used, uh, recognized manufacturers. And Natari does not subcontract that out. Uh, they do their own installation, mm -hmm. um, where Paddock requires a general contractor to purchase and do all the logistics of getting it in and installing it. So that's the biggest difference is that one's a self-installer and the other is not. Okay. In the years that the um, natatorium has been there, is this the first time we've changed the bulkhead? Yes, it is. And the, the structure of the bulkhead is fine. It's all the fiberglass pieces and all the plastic that's deteriorated over time from the water. Anything else? All right. Thank you, Darren. All in favor? <coughs> All right. Any opposed? Okay, next it is recommended that the board approve the following construction contract for the 2021 Northside High School softball field improvements. The base bid is $299,500 um, with alternate one for dugouts at $58,800 and a press box $65,700. The batting cage was not accepted, so the total is $421,000. The project consists of the replacement of the existing softball field, including site grading, fencing, walks, press box, and dugouts, which are located at Northside Park, adjacent to Northside High School. The project is funded from the operations fund, which is identified in the capital projects plan. This recommendation is within the project budget. Project specifications require the work to be complete by September 1st, 2021. And again, questions will be answered by Darren Hess. Is there a motion for approval? I move for approval. Second. Any questions? I yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was out in Tacoma last week and with my son and his family and we visited a city park out there and they were playing softball already out there. The weather's pretty nice, but they have I was I was fascinated because they have softball fields that are all, I don't call it, tur all tur a turf field, not clay. And um, I was, I, I don't know if that type of surface is conducive to Fort Wayne weather, but um, I was thinking of the fact that, you know, they don't have guys from the Parks Department that have to go out and flatten the field and put marks down. I mean, it is permanently in place. I talked to the guys and who played and they said the only thing, they like it, the ball is not, but the ball skips on the surface. But other than that, I was thinking, have we ever looked at that type of a surface for both, for our softball diamonds? For, for softball in this region, in northern Indiana, everyone has a, a skinned or a dirt field. Um, baseball has turf. Um, I do know, I believe it's, it's either somewhere in Fishers or Noblesville, I can't remember which high school, they're going with a turf softball or turf baseball field. Um, I have not heard of any in Indiana for softball yet. Um, it's quite expensive. Uh, we do have World Baseball Academy has a turf, a couple turf fields. Yeah. Uh, but it is starting to become more popular, yes. I'm just trying to figure out if over the long run is there, if there is a return on the investment, the initial investment in not having to maintenance performed on it. Um, and I just, I don't know if we have enough softball diamonds to make it work for us as opposed to parks and recreation here in the city. Yeah, um, I believe it looks more like with with football. It makes more sense with football because you can use it for PE, football, right. band, um, mm -hmm. soccer, multi-use. Where a softball field is a softball field, um, so you have little multi-use yeah. ex uh, exposure to it. So Darren, I was out at the Southside Annex um, uh, a couple weeks ago and saw the new um, softball field that we put in. I have to say, I was really impressed. Um, you guys have done a nice job with it. But I did notice that um, there's a uh, batting cage that was built not only for baseball, but also for softball, because they're right there, you know, next to each other. So um, 
in the interest of fairness, since we put one in at Southside, I'm kind of upset that we can't come up with $16,000 to put in a batting cage at Northside. Yeah, the strategy going forward there was outside the budget. Um, we are hoping, we have a, a strong, um, hefty allowance in for bad soils. Um, that location was where the old developmental center used to be at Northside Park. And the old aerials show uh, a driveway through part of it from historical documents, but we haven't had anyone verify that was ever removed. So um, we have a hefty allowance in there for poor soils for removal. So if we do not use that allowance for that purpose, then we can come back to the board and have a change order to, to do that. Okay. So you think this is going to cost you more than you originally thought because of the topography and the land soils you're dealing with? Is that the the contract you're approving tonight has that included in there? So we have deduct unit prices. So that if it doesn't happen, the price will go down. We're we're making sure we're being uh, we have it covered. So it was our choice not to accept the batting cage, not their choice. Is that because it was more than you thought? Is that right? It's our recommendation to stay within the budget, okay. um, but we. I, I anticipate we'll have funds left over in the, at the end of the project. We should be able to pick it up. Well, I'm glad we're doing this because that um, softball diamond definitely needs um, uh, regrading and needs a lot of work. So I'm glad to see that. Anything else? Thank you, Darren. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And last on their new items is the revised board policies. The policy committee recommends that the board approve updates to the 2000 series of board policy titled program. Additionally, the committee recommends striking policy 8540 health and wellness services, the content of which would be incorporated into 2413 formerly titled health services approving technical changes to policy 6153, <coughs> collection and forgiveness of debt, and adopting policy 8001, bargaining unit determination and representation of employees, which recodifies board policy from 1978. Uh, Raleigh Booker, Jennifer Mathias, and I currently sit on the policy committee, although many of these updates were reviewed and recommended by Julie Hollingsworth and Glenna Yale during their tenure on the committee. These policies were reviewed during the meetings that occurred over several months. Updates made to board policy reflect changes in the law and practices of the district. Red lines and clean versions of the policies were provided to the entire board in advance, in advance of the meeting. Board bylaws and policies are available to the public on the Fortin Community Schools website. Updated versions will replace older ones. And questions will be addressed by David Amon and um, Faye Williams Robbins. Is there a motion on the floor for approval? So moved. Second. Thank you. And do we have any questions? I would just like to comment, and uh, as a former member of the um, committee, um, thank David um, for all of his uh, work on updating all of our policies. And uh, Faye also for sitting in on the committee and, and all of her uh, input. Um, so. It, it thank you to both of them. Yeah, thank you very much. It is a, definitely a great way for a new board member to mm -hmm. learn and understand about the district. And, and um, it, it sounds boring, but <laughs> David makes it quite entertaining. Um, <laughs> and you do learn a lot. <laughs> but, Has um, something changed? Wait a minute. Okay. I think I want to get back on the policy committee. Since you're gone, it's much no. <laughs> but, um, that, but that's why we have Raleigh and Jennifer, because I recommended that, you know, if you really want to learn about the district, then it's, it'll be helpful to be on that committee. And, um, but we're almost, we're almost done. So they can read, they can read what they missed. And you can start all over again. Right. Yeah. We can start all over again. <laughs> Anyway, any other questions, comments? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> okay. And now um, we're going to learn about the Gear Up Fort Community Schools program. Faye Williams Robbins, Chief of Student, Family, and Community Engagement and Pre K 12 College and Career Readiness Manager, Shanita Bolton, will be doing a presentation about the FWCS. Gear Up, which stands for gain, Gaining Early Awareness and Readiness for Undergraduate Programs. Thank you, ladies. Good evening, President Duff, Dr. Daniel, school board members, and viewing audience. 
approximately eight years ago, Fort Wayne Community Schools Administration began a conversation as to how to better support our ever increasingly diverse population. At that time, we began researching, visiting school districts, welcome centers in various parts of the United States looking for best practices and innovative ideas. The result of that research, asking questions, meeting and planning, is our current Family and Community Engagement Center, or what has become known as FACE, a location that brought resources from across the district to one location as a one-stop shop for students, families, and community. As we were planning and organizing supports and resources, we realized that one component needed by all students was a more focused and aligned approach to college and career readiness. It was at this time that we sought and hired a person with not only an education degree and background, but someone with the expertise in post-secondary that could ensure our students understood what was needed for the next steps beyond high school. We found that individual in the person of Shanita Bolton, who we hired from Earlham College. Under Shanita's leadership, we have not only been able to increase the support that we were already providing our students, but increase it exponentially, as well as the funding needed to truly provide students with opportunities, experiences, and knowledge. Tonight, Shanita will be presenting on a grant that we received specifically for increasing parents' and students' knowledge, skills around post-high school future planning. Shanita's team has grown from just herself and one other person to 13 individuals and is continuing to grow, all as a result of the funding that we have received via the Gear Up grant. And at this time, I'll turn things over to Shanita. Thank you, Faye. President Duff, board members, Dr. Daniel, it is a pleasure to speak with you tonight about the Gear Up program. And I'd like to begin with a video. My name is Shanita Bolton, and I am the K-12 College and Career Readiness Manager for Fort Wayne Community Schools. So GEAR UP stands for Gaining Early Awareness and Readiness for Undergraduate Programs. There are three objectives to this grant. One, to increase the academic performance of our students. Two, to increase our graduation rate. And lastly, to make sure that our students and their families are aware and have the knowledge and skills abilities for students to succeed post-secondary. These students also have an opportunity to participate in college visits to work with what are called our GEAR UP student advisors. My role within Gear Up as the Gear Up coordinator of learning partners and programs is to help develop summer programs that give them opportunities to explore these interests. So students who are involved in this program actually can take dual enrollment courses for free at these institutions. Some of the partners that we have outside of our local colleges and universities, Science Central, Texas Instruments. We also offer workshops and seminars for our parents, whether that is on financial literacy, how to complete a FAFSA, how to move through the college application process. So for example, as a ninth grade gear student advisor at the Snyder High School, I want to be able to say that my students have graduated high school um, with the skills um, to be a successful citizen. Statistics show us a few things. We know that if a student applies to two colleges instead of one, that there is a 40% chance that they're more likely to matriculate to college. If they apply to three colleges, that increases that another 10% to 50%. If they apply to five colleges or universities, there is a 70% chance not only that that student will matriculate to college, but also that they will succeed and graduate from college. Even though we could not do some college visits um, during this pandemic, we wanted to make sure we bring those college visits to the students. So oftentimes we may um, have a college visit virtually. You have to realize that this cohort is made up of 3,814 students. Students. We also do workshops that are on Indiana graduation pathways. We really talk about our parents being the steering wheel of this. So we wanted to make sure that uh, when a student's in need, the parents know their needs as well. Everything that we offer to our students is of no cost to them or the family. So we are hopeful that once we reach the end of this grant period, the outcomes will be just as exciting as they are at this point, and we will be able to move forward with this grant for many years to come. I must say, I am the first generation student. I am the student that many thought uh, would not make it to college. We all know 
that life happens. We all go through challenges, um, but I want to be um, a walking story for my students. Ultimately, what I want people to know about the program is that, one, we are fortunate to have it. Two, that parents, students, our communities should take advantage of everything that it offers. If you go to our Fort Wayne Community Schools website and just do a search for Gear Up, it will give you an overview of our program, upcoming opportunities. You can always call our office. The phone number is 260-467-7257. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. So as Faith shared, our office encompasses 14 individuals, including myself. Under the umbrella of K through 12 College and Career Readiness is College and Career Readiness Central, as I call that, which is Amy Termola, which is one of our secretaries. Also, many of you may know Martin Murphy, who has been with the district for quite some time and oversees the 21st Century Scholars Program. Kyle Bond, who is our Family and Community Support Liaison. Also, the Gear Up team, which encompasses now eight individuals, five Gear Up student advisors. Those student advisors right now are divided between two middle schools and one high school, and I'll talk more about the role in just a moment. Also, Neil Davis, who is our Gear Up coordinator, who focuses on scholarships, internships, and job shadowing opportunities. <coughs> Stephanie Carlson is new to our team, and she is the coordinator for Partners in Programming, building relationships with our community-based organizations, also furthering our extension with myself, with colleges and universities for summer programming. And then last but not least, Karen Kill, who I call the backbone of that area, who is our Gear Up secretary. Also, the K-12 alignment falls under college and career readiness, and I will talk about both that and be instrumental because if you think about the K-12 alignment and also the be instrumental program, it is all steering towards college and career readiness and post-secondary success for those students. So as was shared in the video, Europe stands for gaining early awareness and readiness for undergraduate programs. This was established in 1998 and the first awards were in 1999. It's a highly competitive grant that's federally funded. There are many of these awards across the nation. It's very national in scope, and your program really defines this as a key lever that shifts the nation's strategy to improve college and career readiness, particularly for low-income students. So what does Gear Up and why does it exist? Here's some statistics. 70% of Americans say that it is very important for adults in this country to have a degree or professional certificate beyond high school. Only 22% of these Americans agree or strongly agree that they are confident that having only a high school diploma can lead to a good job. Also, we know that 96% of SAT and ACT tested low-income high school students who take these tests, they aspire to go on to a college or university. They just need guidance. As was shared in the video, and I will be very honest, when I came upon this research, I was very struck, and it shifted the trajectory of the ways in which we do our work. Um, and I want to say, gear up while we are college and career readiness. Gear up is very focused for this cohort on post-secondary success leading to matriculation to a college or university. So as shared in the video, applying to two colleges instead of one increases to 40%. And I'm not going to read all those to you because you heard me, but our goal is for every student to apply to at least five colleges or university. This gives them that 70% chance that they would matriculate to college, but also be able to graduate successfully. Here's some key facts on college knowledge. We know particularly for low-income students that they are less likely to know about financial aid than their peers. Also, we know that parents' estimation of these costs correlates with their income. So if you think about our district, also our socioeconomic backgrounds, Many families think they can't afford to go to college, when in reality, many of these students will receive the most financial aid and awards because of their background. Also, without this basic knowledge, we know that parents will overestimate these costs 228%, often leading to them telling their children they can't afford to go to college. So I shared in the video as well the objectives. 
This is to increase academic performance, increase the rate of high school graduation for this particular cohort, and last but not least, to ensure that not only our students, but our families have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to be the backbone for their students and push them along to college. So what is the FWCS Gear Up Grant? In the fall of 2018, in November, we were awarded this grant. We received $3.2 million per year, and I will be honest, when it was just myself and Martin Murphy, I thought we need some money for this department. And then we were awarded, and I said, oh my goodness, we have $3.2 million to spend each year. One thing that's very important to note, for our department, we are K through 12 college and career readiness. However, this grant focuses specifically on our current 8th and 9th graders, the cohort and class of 2024 and 2025. And it will follow them as they matriculate through high school and one year post-secondary. So not only are we providing these supports while they're at FWCS, also ensuring that they are successful their first year of college. Because we know students who do not graduate from college is because they have gone down the slippery slope during their freshman year of college and often then will withdraw. This cohort is made up of 3,814 students. Also, once again, I just want to share, our team does work closely with both students and families. Many programs are focused on students, but without the family support, we know that this cannot be fully successful. Also, one of the exciting things about this grant is it also leads to a scholarship for these students. Hmm. Students who participate in the program and they do not need to apply, if they were at one of our 10 middle schools when we received this grant, they automatically are considered a gear up student. They must, of course, graduate from FWCS and then matriculate onto a college or university, and then they will be awarded at least $1,600. The amount will be based upon the number of students who matriculate and also the number um, that is in that particular funding line when they, when they graduate. So what do we offer? Many of the things we offer for this program, we do K through 12, but particularly for Gear Up. Um, we have Gear Up clubs. Those meet some after school, many of them during the lunch hour. Also, college and career readiness exploration workshops for our students. Many of you are very familiar with our state's 21st Century Scholar program, and one of our goals is to ensure that all of our students by the end of their eighth grade year are enrolled in that program. Also, we assist families, and we do this across the district, particularly for seniors, thinking about that college application. As I tell seniors, we will not write it for you, we will not write your college essay, but we will critique and provide supports to make sure that you are successful. Also, FAFSA assistance, and then as you see, college and career visits as well as college and career fairs. Also, internship and job shadowing opportunities we offer for our students. We have partnerships across Allen County right now with about 45 different businesses and organizations that continues to grow daily. Also offering parent workshops, SAT and ACT prep. Also our outreach programs to our local youth serving organizations. We have partnered with Boys and Girls Club, City Life, Ewell Wilson Center, the Y, and others. And we actually go into those facilities to do programming for them. Also mentorship programs for our students, so the upperclassmen are mentoring the lower class. Summer camps, and while this year, because of COVID-19, has hindered some of those, we actually are doing numerous summer camps this summer. We are offering about 15 to 20 summer camps, depending on the grade level. And we have done that partnering, once again, with local colleges and universities, as well as some of our local arts organizations. We have also partnered with Ivy Tech and Trine University, as well as some other colleges and universities I'll talk about in a minute. But we, for Ivy Tech, we have math tutorial services for our students. Of course, once again, no cost for our students and then for the health sciences, particularly with Trine University. I talked about each of the roles, but I just want to highlight some of the key things that come out of that. Um, with Stephanie's role, of course, as I shared, with our youth serving organizations and our summer camps, also internships, our job shadowing programs, scholarships. 
We also, this year, began our social media platforms with Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and that continues to grow daily. Um, I've seen some of you liking some of those things, so thank you so very much. Continue to share. As well as with our Gear Up student advisors, I'd like to talk about their role just briefly. When we began, these individuals were sixth and seventh graders. So our Gear Up student advisors were divided between two middle schools. Um, they followed this cohort, so currently, because we have current eighth and ninth graders, they are split between the two middle schools and high school. Next year, they will solely be at the high school with ninth and tenth graders, because once again, this cohort is the class of 2024 and 2025. College partnerships, we have partnered with all of our local colleges and universities, uh, partnering for everything, of dual enrollment courses, summer camps, um, different career exploration programs. Also, we have some parent workshops that we are offering with these organizations in colleges and universities as well. These are just a few highlights from this year, all masked up on their Gear Up t-shirts, but really shifting gears towards a brighter future for the class of 2024 and 2025. And at this time, if there are questions, I will be glad to fill those. So this grant just uh, is for those two classes, correct? correct? It's not like you bring in new uh, eighth or ninth graders every year, it's just those two classes. Right that is now. correct. In order to bring in another class, we would need to submit another application oh, for another I grant. See. I yes. see. I got gotcha. you. Does the scholarship dollars come from the grant So. Yes, it comes from the grant. And all 3,814 students in the cohort or have that option of getting that fifteen thousand dollars if they matriculate to college. So it's a. I mean, six, 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 sorry. I, I knew what you meant. <laughs> um, okay, so every one of those child, if they head on to college, have that opportunity. That's correct. And how do these parents? I, I know that there's some built in for, and I was a part of last year's. Um, I was fortunate to attend your mm -hmm. um, dinner for the parents of that first group. Um, how do they know about this other than, I know that they're doing social media and other things mm -hmm. and you have these counselors in there. Is that how they're, because I know several people that fall in this class and I'm, I, this was shocking to me to hear, which is exciting. <laughs> so we have been communicating in a variety of ways with, with parents. Um, to begin, we sent every parent a letter directly to their household to tell them about the Gear Up program. Um, also, we communicate via email as well as, you know, social media, our newsletter. And it's been interesting as the program continues to grow, our students have been the voice in their homes because they're getting more and more excited as opportunities unfold. We have not promoted as much the scholarship program because we wanted to begin to do that once all of our students were in high school. As I shared earlier, it was a little difficult because 10 of the 11 middle schools qualified for the Gear Up program. And so we needed to make sure that there was not that inequity as we were sharing this information. Which one doesn't? Black Hawk. And so it's all income based or? That is correct. Okay. And then the focus is, as you mentioned, it, it says college and career readiness, but it's really on college prep kind of stuff, is that? It is college prep, but if you think about college prep, it's all geared towards a career at the end of college. Correct. So as they are um, learning about the opportunities for colleges and universities, we're also um, taking them on career visits as well, also leading them to job, uh, excuse me, job shadowing opportunities and internships as well. So I'm sorry to be clear, there's 3814 number of kids that represents all the middle schools except Blackhawk? That is correct. Okay, and so all these kids would be eligible for that $1,600 potentially except Blackhawk? That is correct. Well, and let me be okay. a little more specific on that. Because we had some students who transferred from one middle school to Blackhawk, we do have some Blackhawk students who are gear up students. Do we know approximately how much or how many uh, kids per grade that would hit this cohort on a typical year go to college? So it depends on the year. Um, we are, I guess, I want them all to go to college, sure. but if we're looking at our statistics, we're looking first year somewhere around 65 to 70%. So pre-pandemic, about 65 to 70% of our kids that would be first generation college kids like yourself and like myself and like it's targeted to 65 to 70% of those kids go to college? Correct. And for the purposes of this program, what is the definition of college? Is it a four-year institution or? Two-year or four-year. Okay. okay. And is this at any 
college? Does it have to be Indiana State College? Something within the state? It does not. Now, one of the caveats with that is because many of these students are also 21st century scholar students, which requires them to go to school in Indiana to receive that scholarship. So we definitely promote our Indiana schools because we don't want them to lose up on all of their tuition being paid for through the 21st century scholars. And this, this is an additional scholarship that would be added to that for them. So along this line with the 21st century, um, have you seen an increase in this last year's cohort, those eighth graders last year, an increase in numbers of them signing up for 21st century scholar and qualifying? So our current ninth graders, yes. This year, it depends on the school. Um, COVID-19 has, just like with everything that we are doing, has made it a little more, more difficult. Um, but we are constantly engaging with them and making phone calls to families. We're actually going to be doing here soon, on April the 17th, a 21st Century Scholar Enrollment Day at FACE. Um, that's by appointment only, but reaching out to those families who have not enrolled yet. Um, right now, we're averaging, we have some schools that are in the 86 to 70 percent tile that have completed and enrolled so far. Our lowest right now is about 40 percent. What would you say your biggest obstacle is for parents to proceed with the 21st Century Scholar application? I would say for many of our families, it's because it requires a social security number and personal information. And individuals sometimes can't believe that it's going to be free tuition and what is behind the fact that you're asking me for all of this personal information. Have we reached out to past 21st century students who've had family members that have possibly fell, fallen into that and then they receive the 20 to help like be mentors or guides and showing that look I'm it, it was okay to fill this out and I understand that. I understand that that's a barrier but um, I was hoping that maybe we have some that come through that can come back and Possibly. We have not done that, and I love that idea. We have used our teachers that are in the building that have benefited previously from 21st Century Scholar enrollment that have spoke to students, but we have not used alumni to do that. Do you know, and you may not know offhand, but the, the number of ninth graders, that percentage that are enrolled, I mean, that's a fabulous program that there's lots of dollars left on the table each year that we really, however we can get those kids to you know push forward for that i would love to see more of that do we know how many in that ninth grade cohort? of our ninth grade at the end of the year last year our ninth grade we had enrolled as an average about 70 percent of our students okay. now that fluctuated for some schools that were up in the 90 percentile to others who may have been at 50 percent our overall grade? district goal is to have 90 percent at every 90%. school all eighth graders to have 90 percent at least how does this ninth grade group compare to prior years it's about the same it's about the same it fluctuates a couple percent up and down. I really like that parent engagement is part of a component of the Gear Up program. You mentioned that there are workshops that are available. What sort of workshops do you do with parents and families? So a wide variety. So everything of we're getting ready to do two coming up. Um, one, well, let me back up. This past week, we just did one on financial literacy, which was well attended. Um, really talking about how do you save for college? How do you search for a college? What does it look to even evaluate a financial aid package? Um, how you can begin that process early? Because we don't want to wait till students are in high school or families uh, when their student is in high school to engage them in those conversations. We also have had workshops where we talk about what are the questions you need to ask when you're going to your parent teacher night. Uh, many parents we have found don't always know the questions to ask. And so being able to engage in a meaningful manner where they feel empowered is very important for those students. That's good. So I have a question. We have this $3.2 million for this cohort for seven years, and that's fulfilling those eighth and grade, ninth graders now and as they move on. How long until we engage into another grant so that we can start helping all the rest of the kids that are still coming along? And if we don't get that, and we have 13 employees on staff from that grant, what happens? I'm going to leave that question to <laughs> Dr. Daniel, to Faye, to Kathy, and to Charles. <laughs> Just last week we had a meeting with Carol, because I think it was last week. Just to talk about when is it time and, and when can we apply. And so she's looking at the grants. When we have gone to what they call INSEP, which is a training on how to utilize the grant and activities and things that you can do, uh, they have some school districts there that have three or four of these grants going at one time. So there's no real limit. It's just that you want to make sure you're doing a good job so they'll give you the next one. 
And so we had that conversation last week. What do you see as your biggest challenge to be successful? Parent engagement. And if you look statistically across our nation, the Gallup poll shows that there is what they call the fall off the cliff. Parents very engaged at the elementary level. You see a decline at middle school and a major decline by the time they're in high school. So really trying to ramp up parent engagement. Any thoughts on how to overcome that? I think one, we have both through the Garrett program but outside began a program called our Parent Trailblazer program. Um, along with PTA of using the voices of our parents to engage other parents. Um, that's really important. Another piece that we have found is with our youth serving organizations because there are some parents that have a different type of trust with a boys and girls club where their child has been since they were very little um, that they can reach that parent in a different manner and that's also why we go to those youth serving organizations to offer our programming. Um, we're even when it's time for car pickup, disseminating our information in those car pickup lines to make sure that our parents are engaged. Have you guys presented at Title I required events at the schools? Yes, so I'm invited to each of the Title I events and we always do a presentation as well for college and career readiness. The last few schools we've been to, all the principals said, pre-pandemic of course, those were very well attended. And, uh, so, so well attended they thought they had to might go to a bigger <laughs> space and facility. Which is great. Could you talk a little bit about the businesses and the partnerships that, that you're working with in this program? Sure. So we have everything from, and I'll, I'm going to pull it more in instead of the names of the business because I don't want to leave anyone out when you're naming businesses and organizations, um, to into our bullet points of career fields. So everything from the health field um, where we're at have students at our major hospitals who are doing internships, um, advanced manufacturing. We also have them at the radio station. Um, businesses, we have also some unique accounting offices um, we partnered with where our students are at. And if you, I think, I think most of you, if not all of you, get the monthly newsletter. We try to highlight also every month, you'll see a highlight of our internship job shadowing program. And these are eighth and ninth graders doing that? No, so these range, the job shadowing, because since we're K through 12, where our job shadowing opportunities are for our middle school students, and then our internships begin at the high school level. And then could you talk a little bit more, and I'll quit bugging you, about the mentorship with the, it sounds like you have older kids with these 8th and ninth graders? Yeah, so one of the things we have been promoting, um, it's been really, I'm going to be honest, hard this year because given that we are on a blended learning platform, some students, of course, who are virtual, is using our ninth graders, and we're calling them ambassadors, to serve as ambassadors for those 8th graders that are come along as well. We do the same thing with our seniors for FAFSA. Um, we have FAFSA ambassadors that are promoting FAFSA completion in the schools as well. Will the changing graduation standards alter anything that you're now doing? No. And I w probably would have answered that different, Steve, if you would have asked me that probably two or three years ago. But we had already shifted the ways in which we were doing our work because of Indiana graduation pathways. And so at this point, I, I would say no. You're excited about electric works? Very excited. <laughs> I just got to tell you folks that Shanita and I talk all the time uh, in my role as executive director of Latinos Count. Um, she and her department and her folks have been just a terrific asset. We're now joining uh, this year and hopefully moving forward in recruiting the 7th and 8th grade Latino students to sign up. And I think somebody mentioned about trying to find those trusted sources in the community. And so that's what we're going to do in trying to increase that. Um, with Latino families, language is an additional barrier. Um, and um, many Latino families, rightly so, have a distrust of government and government agencies. Um, so we're pitching in and hopefully going to increase the participation rate of Latino families. But I really appreciate all the things that you and your team do. Thank you. Shanita, at your parent workshops, do you have translators there um, or, you know, interpreters? Yes, great question. We all, any of our large events, um, particularly if it is face to face, we have a Burmese translator always and a Spanish translator. So at our event coming up for the 21st Century Scholar Enrollment Day, there will be translators. Thank you. Uh, oh, 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 go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm just going to say that we know I watched this weird um, PowerPoint my anxiety level started to rise because, you know, I've done this three times, the college application process, and even after the third one, I, it was still like, huh, you know, 
very stressful. Um, but anyway, that's not my question. Um, but I, uh, your statistics about how many, you know, you fill out two applications, you have a certain percentage chance to go to college. You have to, you fill out, the more you fill out, the higher your chance of going to college. And I can understand why a lot of our low-income students would only fill out two uh, because it's so expensive. I mean, it can cost you hundreds of dollars just to apply to a variety of colleges. So is there any type of help for these students? Can those costs be covered? Well, many of our students who would fall into the category would receive waivers for those. Uh, more colleges and universities are starting to do fee waivers or no application fee at all. Um, so we really try to lead those students to those. Um, I will say, coming from a higher education background, I also know how to make the phone calls um, <laughs> to say some things and ask some questions that most parents um, cannot. And so that has assisted greatly as well. Awesome. So thinking about the dollars and how long it takes to save for college and the um, mentioned that we have a lot of involvement in elementary. Do we take any of that training and money value back to our parents in elementary school? Because we all know that interest mounts over time and getting that parent to say, if it's $5 a month or whatever back at the kindergarten level, by the time they get to college, I mean, and I know that's, I've had to train somebody in that long time ago telling her, do not go through the McDonald's parking lot and get your dollar Pepsi. Instead, put it in your son's college account and eventually, and took a compound interest calculated to her to try to show her what her five you know, her dollar Coke was costing her. But I just wondered if we could, if we have programs like that in elementary for those parents where we're seeing a lot of involvement of parents, if that would be a, something that we would... Sure, because we are K through 12 college and career readiness, we do have workshops for our elementary students and for the parents as well. Um, actually on our financial literacy workshop that we held last week, we did have some elementary parents on there. Um, so we are doing that, yes. Okay, great. I will say at the elementary level though, there's much more work to be done. I guess I will say one more thing. I think this is a great asset for our district and uh, you and Faye, I know work hard at this and. I spent a lot of time with Faye about a year ago and even a snowstorm talking about this. So got to know a lot more than I ever dreamed I would, but it's a great program, a great asset for our district. And, uh, you know, those watching on Facebook or whatever, and Ashley, please print this, parents of eighth grade, kids in the district now, you have an amazing opportunity. And please take advantage of this free, amazing opportunity. The deadline is June 30th, but I strongly encourage you to get your child enrolled before May 25th, before yep. they leave the building. So please, please do not miss out on this free money. Exactly. Before Shanita sits down, I do want to take the opportunity because I don't know when she may be back up to present. But because of the work that she and her team are doing, we have received state recognition for FAFSA completion. Uh, she has done a tremendous job and so we now have people calling us it's not just FAFSA either it's 21st century 21st as century. well so the state they actually went down to Indianapolis and received certificates for each of the schools that qualified so we are recognized across the state for the work that she does she worked in the she was the director of admissions at the college where she came from and so the knowledge that she's bringing is just something we would not have had without her but as we are looking at how we move forward, the work she's done has just been uh, tremendous and we appreciate everything that she's done. We now get phone calls from other school districts who see the reports that come out from the state wanting to come here, sit and talk with her and her team to figure out how they can do what she's been doing. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. We're glad we have you. Glad to be here. <laughs> Okay, I guess we're ready for board comments. No additional comments from me. Holly? I just want to give a, a shout out to Principal Klein at Abbott Elementary. I follow them on Facebook, and one of the things that they do every single day is they do their announcements live on Facebook, and I think it's a really wonderful way to engage their virtual students and the parents and uh, make them feel still feel a part of the school. They can see inside the school. They they do contests live on Facebook, so I, I think that's a really awesome thing that they do. So I really want to recognize them and say great job. Awesome. Um, tonight I'm going to highlight Shandall Elementary School. Um, Principal Neil Rupp, um, I was fortunate enough to take a tour, Ann and I were, and um, 
not too many days after that, they had a readathon, and there were several people in our district um, that they asked us to come and um, be guest speakers. And I know Dr. Daniel was one, I was one, um, Get Nickel was also one. Um, they were happy to report, um, they did something every day that related to a genre of reading, which I thought was fun. Um, they did a dress up day. They had us guest readers. They had um, door decorating. Um, they also used it as a fundraiser for their school and um, obviously did a lot of reading. Um, the school, I believe, is roughly around maybe 400 students, and I may be a little bit off. But um, with that, they had 18,110 minutes of reading with, throughout that week. So um, I just wanted to highlight Shambal and the great work that they're doing over there. So go Hornets. I have no comments. Julie? Um, just a reminder to uh, parents who have, particularly parents who have participated in um, a lot of the um, um, presentations that Ann and others have done uh, regarding uh, the legislature and uh, bills, uh, particularly uh, education savings accounts and vouchers, the uh, hearing of the Senate, it's the Appropriation Committee and it's the Education Subcommittee. Is that correct, Kathy? meets Thursday? It's the school funding formula. Right, yeah. right. Um, but uh, yes, to discuss uh, school funding and um, education savings accounts and um, uh, voucher expansion. So um, I know that uh, locally Senator Brown is a member of the committee and uh, I forget, right. she on the subcommittee? She is on the subcommittee. Okay, okay. So parents, please, um, if you're interested in this at all, at all and want to see um, public schools get their, uh, you know, rightfully proportional share of uh, new funding in this uh, budget, um, let Senator Brown know. No, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Ann's been busy with Jennifer, I guess, and me, myself. We got to go to Forest Park, Lakeside, and Lane all since the last meeting. So. Uh, Really enjoyed our visits with Sarah Workman at Forest Park Elementary, um, Ellen Jones today at Lakeside Middle School, and Matt Heron at Lane. Uh, the principals were great, very accommodating, and had great conversations. Um, the students always that we visit or saw seem engaged. Uh, really impressed with those little kiddos at Forest Park and masking up and continuing with their masks. Um, just really enjoy getting out and seeing the kids and seeing the schools operate. It's been a lot of fun. I'll echo what. Uh, Julie said and add the phone number is 1-800-382-9467 to call Senator Brown or Senator Bush or Senator Cruz or Senator Mishler. We'd appreciate your support and wish Kathy luck on uh, Thursday in her testimony. And everybody have a safe and uh, good spring break. Dr. Daniel? Yes. Uh, so back to our students we had earlier today, um, specifically the young lady Paige Lowry for that uh, video. Uh, when we saw that, that did change our minds in regards to graduation as well as prom. So we continue to keep those doors open. Um, we will have graduation at the Coliseum uh, unless the virus takes a, a tremendous dive, uh, meaning that uh, the virus increases dramatically. So uh, we're hoping for that as well as for our uh, seniors and even juniors to be part of their their prom so but because of that particular video uh, the discussion even just uh, probably four weeks ago was should we have it or should we not and I think you can tell by that video that uh, something something that is normal needs to happen for our current seniors and hopefully um, this will be the last time we'll have to experience this second of all um, as you've seen tonight through uh, Shanita's presentation. FACE is our hub of our future as we start to look at expanding internships throughout all of our high schools. Um, I truly appreciate her leadership and FACE leadership as well because as we examine our pipelines, we have to have a focus point, a center point, and they are the, if you will, they're the axis of which all the spokes will be generating from. So again, I think we're in great hands and I'm really looking forward to the future when we have these types of professionals working with us. Thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> I know we've uh, given Mary Hess lots of kudos because she, we know she's done a great job for us this year. Um, and she is our director of nursing, in case you didn't know that. But, but I wanted to, I asked her for a name of someone who's on the ground in the, one of our nurses so I could talk to her just to see what it's like to be a nurse at a school today. And she gave me the name of Jackie Durheimer, and she is at Lincoln. And when I talked to her, she said that the stress level for nurses has just risen like quadruple just be, from this year. Um, she said normally the, the nurse clinic, or whatever they're called in a school, you know, that's um, a place where kids go when they're, when they're sick, when they lose a tooth. And it's not a fearful place to go. Um, they, you know, they know the nurse. It's going to be a friendly place to go. But now, it's you know almost the opposite. They're they're fearful when they have to go see the nurse. And it's not the same walk-in procedures like it was. You know, they have to make sure they have a, get a phone call. So there's only one down to the nurse's office. So there's one student at a time going there. Um, they're probably fearful because they may be sent to the COVID room, which all the high school, I guess, have, have set up. There's uh, Lincoln is in the section of the cafeteria where they can then, if they need to be picked up by a parent, they just go out a door of the building that way. Um, one of the stressful things that it sounded like to me was if there is a student who does get COVID and needs to be um, quarantined, then the school nurse is responsible for all that contact tracing, which at Lincoln, it would mean that entire classroom perhaps any other people in the building they came in contact with, but mostly their classroom. And then, of course, um, students that, that they would sit near on the bus. So she said that, you know, there's been times when she's had to make phone calls from home, um, which usually is 30 or more phone calls when someone does have um, a case or needs to be quarantined. Um, she lo what she does like about her job, non-COVID though, she feels like she's the mom of the school. Um, like I said before, it is a safe place for those kids. They come there when they're hurt, maybe when they lose a tooth. Some come when they're sad because they you know, might be in school for the first time and they miss mom and dad. Um, and she said this year it has changed a little bit because the kids are more quiet, they're a little more standoffish. Um, because initially when they came, they just weren't sure how they were supposed to behave in school. Um, it's just so much different this year. Um, but normally, um, the joys are, you know, just building those relationships with kids. Like a lot of the people on the ground I've talked to, you know, they, they love being with the kids. Um, she said that they, um, like I mentioned, they come in for a variety of things. And sometimes it's, you know, it's just their go, that's the nurses, their go-to person, even though they might not be physically ill. Um, but it's just, uh, someone to lean on, someone to talk to when you're, um, feeling blue. Um, so... It was, I learned a lot. It was very interesting um, to learn exactly what the school nurse does and how, how things have changed. And typically, we'll ask when we're visiting these schools, like, what would you know, what things have you learned in COVID that you would do, continue to do? And um, as far as nursing, there's nothing that she would want to keep <laughs> doing. <laughs> Let's go back to the original pre-COVID way. Um, but um, also, I wanted to mention that um, last Monday, I um, joined. I was a guest, I guess, of South Bend School Board's um, uh, um, meeting. They had just to pass their resolution against the um, ESAs and House Bill 1005 and the other bills that are um, involved, the school cho or choice scholarships slash vouchers and that type of thing. Um, and at that time, this was last Monday, I know I told them that you were the 80, they were the 81st school to pass the resolution. Well, this weekend, it, um, I saw on Facebook that we are now up to 106 school districts that have passed the resolution against ESAs. Um, so like Julie said, please contact your senators, tell them that ESAs are not okay, especially, you know, um, Senator Bush, Senator Cruz, Senator Brown. Um, make sure that you contact them. That's all you have to do is tell them that ESAs are not okay. We do not want them in our budget bill. And um, can't preach that enough. <laughs> okay. Um, that is the end of our meeting. Is there a motion on the floor to adjourn? I move for adjournment. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Meeting adjourned. <coughs>